Thank you, Anthony. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you, Raju. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. As Raju said, um, my name is Anthony Marinello. I'm the owner of Drops and Native Landscapes. I'm the creator of the Long Island Native Plant Gardening Group on Facebook. And we actually made it over 4,000 members last year. So that's actually a big milestone for us. We've been doing this for two years now, the group has been open. And um, so 4,000 members is really good. And we're growing about 100 members a week now, now that it's spring again. So we're growing as quick as the gardens. So today we're gonna to be talking about pocket prairies. Um, these are small plantings with huge potential. <clears throat> you may be asking yourself, what is a pocket prairie? So a pocket prairie is really just a small restoration of a prairie ecosystem or grassland ecosystem that you would create in a section of your own yard. Um, it's really not organized in a way, so it doesn't really get designed particularly as a regular garden would. It's more of a naturally organized type of garden where um, you are more you're more trying to replicate a natural prairie than creating a garden for human use. Um, and these can be very small. They can be five by five. They can be 10 by 10. Um, you know, I, the way I have it actually priced out on my site is 100 square feet to 500 square feet. So, you know, no matter what size of an area you have that can be filled, you can fill that up with some prairie plants and you can make a difference. Um, whether you want to just, you know, clear that little bit of lawn that's in the corner of your property that no one ever uses and create a vibrant little patch of life or, you, you know, you want to convert the entire lawn, you know, you can do that as well. And um, a pocket prairie is a, a solution for you. So why should you consider planting a pocket prairie? Um, wildlife is running out of space. We're losing natural habitat due to overdevelopment, invasive species, climate change, and multiple forms of pollution. Altogether, these are forming or conjoining into the Anthropocene, which is also known as the six mass extinction, the insect apocalypse. We're losing amphibians, we're losing megafauna, we're losing songbirds. Um, this is just a way for us to give back to the planet, restore what used to be, and try to prevent these tragedies from continuing on the planet, at least within our own neighborhoods and, and towns. So you may also be asking yourself, Prairies on Long Island, what, you know, am I crazy? Sorry, let's go back. Am I crazy? Why am I saying prairies on Long Island? Um, so Long Island actually is home to a few different types of grass and ecosystems. Early settlers who came to Long Island um, were met with a treeless prairie, which is now known as the Hempstead Plains. Uh, that took, actually was most of Nassau County consisted of the Hempstead Plains. It was just grasslands and you know a few shrubs, but for the most part, no trees. And it is still to this day, the only tall grass prairie east of the Allegheny River and the Allegheny Mountains. So it's a very unique, very imperiled and endangered ecosystem. It's globally unique. There's no other habitat like it on the planet. Um, this also coupled with the salt marshes and the maritime grasslands along the coast, um, especially along the South shore of Long Island made Long Island, the perfect place to settle for European colonizers, and they would graze their livestock, specifically sheep and cattle. Um, many of the locations on Long Island still bear that history with their names. Great Cow Harbor, Kanak Peninsula up in Port Washington, Mutton Town is another example. Um, the lack of trees in the Hempstead Plains actually also had to do with a lot of the development that happened on Long Island because it was just easy to plow. You didn't have to clear any forest. Um, so it became, you know, for a while, Long Island was the potato capital of the world. Uh, the, the field behind my home, which is now the high school and the middle school for West Hempstead, was a potato farm up until the mid 1900s. So, you know, for a, a, the large portion of Nassau County that was the Hempstead Plains ended up being turned into farmland, ended up being turned into airfields, especially um, during World War One and World War Two, And that's why now we're known as the cradle of aviation because it was just a perfect um, mix of habitat and environment for us to just build an airfield. We didn't have to clear anything, we could just get it done. Later, um, aviation manufacturer Grumman also took advantage of this ecosystem and they created the Lunar Space Module and helped us get to the space race. So we owe a lot to our little prairie on Long Island. It made us our little, uh, made our Long Island famous and it gave us our um, place in the world as we know it today.
So the Hempstead Plains, like I said, it's the only tall grass prairie in the east. This map to the right shows the extent that it used to cover. And as you can see, most of the development that you see here kind of fills in here. You can see right along where the hills start happening on the North Shore, there's still not so much development. There's still a lot of trees. You know, there's towns in here, of course, but for the most part, the heavy development happened right where the plains were. Um, it was roughly 38,000 acres, and some people think that it might have actually extended both from Massachusetts through Long Island into New Jersey. Now it only consists of a few small patches. The only official remainder of it is the Friends of the Hempstead Plains Preserve, which is adjacent to Nash Community College. Um, there's a few restoration and maybe a few remnants in um, Eisenhower Park and Bethpage State Park that might have not been ever developed, but there's still debate about that. For the most part, the plants are still here and there if you know where to look for them. This ecosystem most resembles the Midwestern prairies and it contains the big four prairie grasses. So that's little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass and switchgrass. The other grassland ecosystem that we have on Long Island is the maritime grasslands. Um, so early 19th century maps and photos show that nearly the entire Eastern end of Long Island was covered in tall grass prairie-like vegetation. The Montauk Indians were the keepers of this ecosystem and they scheduled burns, the, they prescribed burns and that's how they kept this ecosystem open and kept it grassy and kept the woodlands from encroaching. And that made it easier for them to maneuver. It made them easier for them to hunt. And it just kept the land open and kept the land in a constant state of rejuvenation. Those grasslands were then used by the colonists to graze their own herds of domestic animals such as sheep and cattle. Um, Montauk is actually the home of the first and oldest cattle, cattle ranch in the country. Um, so the home of the original American cowboy actually took place in Montauk. Um, this, so the Sayville grasslands actually is probably the most famous at this point. Um, and these are still prescribed to be burned by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. The last time they burned these was 2016. So grasslands require that environmental disturbance. They require either large herds of herbivores such as deer, elk, or bison coming through. Um, you could simulate that obviously with domestic livestock. Um, lately, different organizations and villages and municipalities on the island have opted to go to using goats to help clear land because um, you can't really contain the deer to have them do it for you. So that's another option. So what kind of wildlife can you support with a pocket prairie? All kinds of wildlife. So, for, so beneficial insects, we utilize it, pollinators, songbirds, foxes. E even though you're creating this little patch in, in your yard, you'll still see big benefits and it could be the launch pad for a greater garden for you to create so that you can expand from there. But it's a great starting point. Um, it, it just really, once you get started, you, it's kind of like an addiction. You, uh, you'll you notice the change in the wildlife around your home. You'll start noticing different forms of wildlife and you just won't want to stop. So you may also be asking yourself, why are grasslands so important? Why would you want to create a pocket prairie? So grasslands are recognized globally for having a high level of biodiversity. Wherever there are grasslands, there tends to be a very high amount of biodiversity. Large amounts of insects, large amounts of grazing fauna such as deer, elk, um, different kinds of predators such as birds of prey, foxes, coyotes, depending on where you are in the world. Think of the prairie states out west. We used to have herds of millions of bison. Um, you think about the, the grasslands of Africa where there's wildebeest, zebra, lions, um, even South America has large areas of grasslands where they have herds of capybara, um, mountain lions, down there they call them pumas, not really in the mountains anymore, and um, all sorts of different birds, wading birds, different things like that. So they also act as carbon sinks. So our prairie plants, while most people say, you know, plant trees, plant trees to help with global warming, that's a great option. A lot of times people in the suburbs are scared to grow trees or they no longer wish to grow trees. 
I'm at the point where people are going to be cutting down trees. Like I mentioned earlier, I lost another sycamore on my block today. They cut down the whole hundred year old tree in a couple hours. Um, fine, but try to replace it then with some prairie plants because where we are historically was prairie. So we could cut down the trees that technically shouldn't even be here because we wouldn't have been forested and replace them with prairie grasses that actually absorb a whole lot of carbon dioxide. Some of the most, the highest levels of um, carbon sequestration actually happen with prairie ecosystems and it increases exponentially each year. So the older the prairie system is, the higher ca uh, carbon capturing capabilities that system has. So the same roots that absorb and store the carbon dioxide also help preserve the soil by preventing erosion and filtering our rainwater. And because the soils are rich and fertile, they're often utilized for agricultural purposes, like I mentioned earlier. So they're actually more imperiled than rainforest and more imperiled than our woodlands because we just don't give them the attention. We don't look at a field and say, that's something that should be preserved. We look at a forest and say, wow, how beautiful that should be preserved. We get sad when they cut down the woods to put up a housing development, but most people don't really notice if they were to you know, bulldoze a prairie and put up a, a housing development. So that's also something to consider that these ecosystems are highly imperiled and that we can make a difference by including them in our home and it doesn't take much because you don't have to worry about planting a tree that is eventually going to grow to 80 feet tall, cast shade, and possibly cause problems for you or your neighbors. You can still have all the benefits and ecosystem services that come along with native plants, but instead opt for a pocket prairie planting. So here's just a diagram of the prairie plants that you may find in a prairie ecosystem. Um, so a lot of these tend to be some Midwest species, such as the um, compass plant or the, uh, where is it over here? The purple coneflower. Um, we do have native to Long Island. We have Indian grass, we have um, side oats grandma, we have switchgrass. Um, we do have yellow indigo, not white wild indigo. So, but you can just look at all these plants and see how deep these roots go. Some of these roots are going 15 feet or more deep. So that's very important. Um, they really, what they do down there, most people thought they were um, actually sor sourcing water, the water table, but it turns out that much of the water that plants absorb, that these plants are absorbing happens right at the surface. And we're still discovering what these roots are doing so deep. Um, the leading hypothesis now is that they're just absorbing minerals and nutrients that deep. But what they do do, and what we do know that they do is they will bring up nutrients from this deep down in the soil and bring it up to the surface, which is why these soils also tend to be so fertile. As these plants are grazed, these roots die off and any of those minerals and nutrients stored within the soil get released back into the soil and again, perpetuates that nutrient cycle and that fertilization of the soil. Here's an actual physical representation of prairie plants and their roots. Um, here, it looks like they may be yeah, this is compass plant actually. I only know, I actually, I grow compass plant in my own garden. Again, it's not a native to the Northeast, but um, it's a Midwest native. It was an accident on my part, part actually, because I had was using the incorrect, was using the USDA maps at the time when I first got started with this to, to research where a plant was native. And the USDA plants database is not the best database to use. And we will go over what database is best to use. But you can just see how deep these roots go and how long these tap roots are and the grasses, how far down their roots go. And this is really what we're trying to, to do and utilize these native plants for. So you may also be asking, how do you maintain your pocket prairie? Um, after you plant the plants out and they get established, the main issue is just weeding for invasive species. You wanna just keep out the invasive species and keep in the native ones. Many times after planting out a pocket prairie, what'll happen is other native plants will start coming in because the wildlife, such as this, mostly the songbirds actually, because they bring in a lot of plants in their fecal deposits. Um, they will bring in species, um, fruit species, they'll bring in tree species, they'll bring in seeds in their droppings and you'll get even more native plants and free plants. But sometimes those plants are also non-native plants. So that's where the weeding comes in handy. Um, you learn to identify what should be growing, what shouldn't be growing and how to remove that and how to keep your 
your prairie planting native. Um, the seasonal cutback is something I always recommend. It helps things stay a little more neat, especially if you're doing it in the front of your house. So you can cut back your plants two thirds by July 4th and you wanna leave the leaves. So any leaves from your trees that are around your prairie that happen to fall into your prairie grass or any plants, any of the plant mass that you cut back in the spring or even when you cut back in around July 4th, do that seasonal cutback. The ideal situation would be to just drop all of that plant matter right on the soil where it, you know, right where you're cutting it. So that way it becomes fresh mulch. It protects your soil, it protects your plants and it slowly will break down into the soil. And while it does that, it will also provide habitat for wildlife, such as beneficial insects, um, pre uh, insects that songbirds and other animals prey on, such as you know worms, beetles, um, that frogs will prey on, that um, salamanders, snakes, different things like that. But also, the songbirds will utilize those little twigs and sticks and stems and grasses to actually build their nests with. So right now, in my own garden. Um, the robins and the morning doves are out there every morning gathering nesting material, whether it's ripping off pieces of grass to go weave a nest with it, taking little pieces of sticks, um, or even actually ripping the fibers off of the stalks of, of um, butterfly weed and swamp milkweed. They will actually rip the fibers off to then use to weave their nest. You also will don't want to be deadheading your plants. Um, you can see the seeds here of this. Uh, I believe this is a New York aster. So these seeds will sustain songbirds and other wildlife through the winter. So you want to leave those standing and you want to let those seeds do their thing and allow birds to come in and eat them through the winter. So this image was taken by my friend and moderator on my Facebook group, Carl Hook, and he takes photos of almost everything that he sees when he's out exploring. Um, this is a chickadee feasting on some sumac berries. And that as, sumac is actually one of the shrubs that you will find growing in a prairie ecosystem. So if you're doing a larger pocket prairie, that might be a beautiful accent for you to choose for the center of it to provide some structure and to provide some added ornamentation. The last thing is, especially for this time of year, which is everyone's talking about, is you want to alter the spring cleanup. So you don't want to be, you know, rushing out there the first warm day, cleaning up all the leaves and cutting back all the dead stems. You want to wait until mid to late April. Right now, this week, we're about 10 degrees warmer than we should be. We should still be in the high 30s and low 40s. Um, within the next couple of weeks, we should be above 50 degrees for at least a week. So once your average temperatures reaches above 50 degrees for once a week and the nighttime temperatures are no longer dipping below freezing, you can feel comfortable enough to go out and cut back your stems, but also observe the bees yourself, observe your garden, see if you see bees flying around. Um, for example, I have seen many bumblebees now emerging from my garden in different locations. Again, bumblebees aren't what you're protecting if you're not cutting back your plants, but they do enjoy the leaf litter and you know having that mulch down lightly. But um, the smaller bees is what you want to really look for. And I have some pictures of them later. Oh, actually, I have some pictures of them now. So native, these are some native stem nesting bees. And this is one of those four prairie grasses, the, the big four. This is switchgrass. This is from my own garden. So you can see these little tiny bees, very tiny, smaller than my pinky nail. These bees are utilizing these hollow stems. This was last April or May, I believe. And this is after I did the cutback. So I think it was May. And I was able to just sit on the porch and observe, you know, I don't want to say swarms, but it because it wasn't that crazy of a situation, but there was a nice population of these little bees utilizing all of my hollow stems and my switch grasses. So grasses are very um, important for stem nesting bees, sometimes more so than the flowering perennials such as um, blazing star or butterfly weed or um, some purple cone flower, which I'll also bring up purple coneflower and rudbeckia for the most part are not native to Long Island. And those are the quintessential prairie plants of the Midwestern states. So many times they are recommended for native plants um, for our region, but they, they truly aren't native to our region. So there's plenty of other native plants to utilize besides echinacea and black-eyed Susan. So the benefits for people, if you plant out your own pocket prairie, is you'll have some cleaner air, water, and soil. Um, you know, any decrease in lawn surface 
you know, decreases the amount of chemicals, decreases the amount of emissions put into maintenance. So it's always a benefit to decrease any bit of lawn. And once you incorporate a pocket prairie into it, it's, you know, the benefits just keep on piling up. Um, you increase and preserve biodiversity for a healthier and more resilient ecosystem. You'll be able to actually observe every morning songbirds coming in, feeding on your seeds, looking for insects in the leaf litter, um, or just singing and claiming your garden and your little pocket prairie as their own. Um, you will preserve soil and decrease stormwater runoff. Many times you can opt for your pocket prairie to also be a rain garden where it is a slight depression in the soil. Um, your roof runoff or your driveway runoff can fill that depression and within 12, 24 hours, it will all percolate back into the soil and you'll just have a beautiful little pocket prairie that you'll never have to water and you never have to worry about. The other benefit is it's, you know, these grasslands are beautiful. They deserve to be preserved. They deserve to be restored. So adding a little pocket prairie to your own property increases the beautification and ornamentation of our homes and the community surrounding you. Um, trees in particular add value to the homes in the neighborhood. So they are often given um, a little bit more attention, but perennial plantings, especially in New York, are actually also considered um, you know, capital improvements on your home. So they also add value to your home and the community as well. So it's also a great learning space for children and adults. Um, many adults actually are not as in tune with nature as they'd like to be. And creating a small pocket prairie is a perfect option to reintroduce yourself to nature and just see what you could, you know, what kind of life you could foster right outside your own door. Um, and it will nurture your soul. There's, you know, just that exposure to nature on a daily basis. Um, when I go for my walk every day in the morning with my dog, it's just lawn after lawn after lawn after lawn. But my house, there's just so much diversity and there's just, you know, the landscape is just completely different. There's just you know, different structures, different wildlife, different sounds, whether it's the wind rustling through the grass that's standing in the winter or, you know, the, the high diversity of songbirds that are all competing and, and, you know, or getting along for claiming my garden as their own. And, you know, I even see the robins are starting to nest, the mockingbirds are starting to nest again. Um, I'm hoping that we either get some chickadees or wrens nesting again in the, in the garden. So, by putting out a pocket prairie, you'll be providing habitat and, you know, supporting not only wildlife, but also humans as well. So some prairie wildlife that you're likely and also not likely to see if you were to plant out a pocket prairie. So large herbivores like elk, bison, which were are extir extirpated if they were ever present on Long Island. There are some historical accounts of certain species, or at least, you know, parts of the species such as antlers or horns that people kind of uh, debate whether they were actually here or whether the Native Americans just traded and brought their materials here. But we do still have white-tailed deer, Eastern cottontails, groundhogs. For the most part, white-tailed deer actually don't eat our grasses. So pocket prairies are a great option for anyone who is in deer country, um, Suffolk County in particular. There's a lot of deer out there. Um, deer really pr prefer to eat they're browsers, so they prefer to eat brush. They eat stems, shoots, um, woody stuff, bark. They really don't enjoy eating our native grasses. And one of the, the great ways of preventing deer damage to your garden is to create a garden that's largely made of native grasses. So that's one other option for you if you're in deer country. I know deers are also now started, the deer are also now starting to make their way over to the North Shore of Long Island. So that's another great option if you find yourself all of a sudden dealing with deer eating your, your plants, um, you may want to think about installing a pocket prairie on your property instead. So birds, by far birds are probably the most diverse group of animals you'll find within a prairie system and the most um, noticeable by you because they, you know, they're noisy, <laughs> they fly around so they can make it to your garden. Um, the barriers that are often in the way of other wildlife, such as turtles or, or you know, more terrestrial species, doesn't affect birds as much. And so you'll see grasshopper sparrows, meadowlarks, the New York state bird, which is Eastern bluebirds, quail, grouse, turkey. Um, we actually have an extinct prairie chicken, which was known as the heath hen, which is, has you know, long been extinct now on Long Island. Um, sandpipers and killdeer are also 
more um, grassland species. Um, and killdeer are very adaptable. I've heard killdeer singing in the Walmart parking lot in Westbury. They, um, they make do with any large open area that they can uh, nest in and find insects to eat. Some reptiles and amphibians that might be attracted to a prairie garden, a uh, pocket prairie would be garter snakes, Eastern hognose snakes, milk snakes, Eastern tiger salamanders, leopard frogs, spade for toads. And these are all beneficial. A lot of people kind of get a little worried about reptiles. We don't have any venomous reptiles left on Long Island. All of the cottonmouths, all of the timber rattlesnakes, they've all been hunted to extinction on Long Island. So the only things left are the non-venomous beneficial, you know, even the venomous ones are beneficial. You just need to respect them. But all of these animals are beneficial. They eat pest species or species that we consider pests, such as insects, um, worms, slugs, beetles. And then there's the predators that you might find in your garden. So red and gray foxes, coyotes are new to the scene. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing them expand to the island and altering our ecosystems. They will not only alter the ecosystem by hunting the deer and changing their browsing and grazing habits, but they also spread a large amount of seed in their own scat um, when they eat fruit, wild fruit, such as um, native crab apple, dogwood fruit, um, service berry fruit, blueberries, coyotes and foxes, uh, wild canes tend to actually eat a lot of wild fruit more so than you'd think. And they're responsible for spreading around a lot of different kinds of native plants in their, in their scat. Um, so snowy owls over the winter is, a, is you know, a much sought after bird for Long Island in the grasslands, mostly the maritime grasslands all along the South Shore. People go out and take photos of snowy owls. Short-eared owls are also found on the South Shore of Long Island. These are federally endangered species. Um, and the American kestrel, which is getting more and more imperiled, um, most likely due to pesticide use. They are our smallest bird of prey. They will eat small songbirds, but they also will eat something as small as a grasshopper. So they also love prairie ecosystems. And don't be surprised if you happen to see any of these guys either, you know, taking up residence on your property now that you've included a pocket prairie or just passing through during migration and taking advantage of the habitat you've created. So you may also be asking yourself how to get started. So you want to locate your ecoregion. For example, if you are in Nassau County and you're in the center of the county, you want to try to recreate the Hempstead Plains ecosystem, which is slightly different than the maritime um, grassland ecosystem along the South Shore. And, but you know, vice versa, if you're on, I know one of our guests is from Long Beach, another one was out in, in Ridge, which is more of the Pine Barrens, but also Ridge also is very, you know, smack dab in the middle of the maritime grasslands that used to be, you know, we've lost some of that to the Pine Barrens now, as we cut the fire out of the ecosystem, the forest has taken over. But that whole area from Montauk through the Hamptons, all the way along the South Shore through Sayville, and then all the Barrier Islands, those are all maritime grasslands. The dunes tend to be grasslands as well. Um, those are dune grassland ecosystems. So if you're on a Barrier Island, if you're along the South Shore, you know, these guides right here, the guides that New York Natural Heritage Program. That's a great resource. The New York Plant Atlas is a great resource that will show you county by county if a species is native to it. So if you're being you know, super specific to your very spot on Long Island, that'll help you. And then wildflower.org is a great option as well for you to do research. It helps to know the the you know the botanical name of your of your plants that you're dealing with so here is our native cactus so if you are on the south shore of long island or on the barrier islands and you're trying to do a maritime grass on ecosystem and you want to do a pocket prairie we may opt for including some eastern prickly pear for you because that historically would be found in those ecosystems so the binomial nomenclature is what scientists use to classify life on earth so Eastern prickly pear, the common name is Eastern prickly pear. There's a few other common names for it as well. Um, the genus and the species. So Imputia humifusa is the full um, botanical name. Often it is either Latin or Greek. So if you're familiar with a little Latin, maybe you took it in high school or maybe you speak Spanish or Italian, you're off to a good start. Or if you're Greek, you're also off to a good start. Um, 
And you want to, you know, once you get your list of plants together, you want to make a plan. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be designed because it's a pocket prairie. It's not a garden. So really, you know, a little controlled chaos isn't a bad thing for, for a prairie. You want to go grass heavy. Most of these ecosystems, that's the main um, characteristic is heavy grasses. So there's lots of blue, little blue stem is the number one most populous grass on the island. Then you have switchgrass, big blue stem, Indian grass, um, Cytos grandma, those are all great options. And then you have um, the wildflowers such as annual bluets, butterfly weed, green milkweed, um, wrinkle leaf goldenrod, we have New York aster, New England aster, um, all of these different wildflowers to mix in with the grasses to uh, create your biodiverse pocket prairie. You want to find a place to source your plants, um, you know, a reputable nursery. There's a few of us now, you know, Rewild is offering their plant sale. I, th um, I think it's going on for another week or so, you said, Raju. Um, I'm also offering some native plant sales. There's a few other native plant sales happening around the island. So, you know, find your reputable native plant resource, get your plants, prep your space, whether you want to do sheet mulching, whether you want to rent a sod cutter and just flip over the sod and plant directly into it you want to solarize your garden, um, you can you know, kill the lawn that way. Whichever option you want to go with, go with it and just dive right in and get dirty and start planning out your pocket prairie. So I just want to give a special thank you to Rewild Long Island, the members of the Long Island Native Plant Gardening Group. Like I said, we are over 4,000 members. Um, I'd be nowhere without the members of the group. <laughs> you guys give me, um, you know, a lot to do with my life now. Um, I've inspired a lot of people myself. You guys inspire me as well. I've heard some great things um, from people who have just come to tell me how much they appreciate the group and, and how it really, especially during the pandemic, it really gave them a purpose to their life, um, something to do every day, something to look forward to, um, whether it's you know getting rid of their invasive species and finally planting out their garden to actually seeing the difference day by day of what their actions have done and how the wildlife around them has benefited so much from their direct action and direct planting of native plants. The Long Island Native Plant Initiative, uh, LIMPI. Um, I'm also a board member with LIMPI, uh, Raju is as well. And um, we actually preserve the genetic heritage of our Long Island native plants. So we go around and we collect seed all over the island. We make a founder's plot out in Brentwood. We mix all the genetics from all over the island to make our founding um, crop. And then our goal is to eventually offer this to sale to commercial growers so that we have a source of our own genetic ecotype native plants on Long Island, um, especially with our grasslands. So another great organization in Nassau County is Friends of the Hempstead Plains Preserve. They are in charge of the last little official remnant of the Hempstead Plains. They are largely, like most organizations, volunteer-based. Um, even the maintenance that happens is all volunteer-based from either the community or the NASA Community College students that are next door that um, will come and help out. So that is all for today. I don't have many pictures of Pocket Prairies, mainly because I'm just starting to offer this myself. So I'm hoping in the future, I'll be able to share some great new Pocket Prairies on Long Island so that everyone can see their beauty and the beneficial um, ecosystem services that they create. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to Q and A. Uh, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Anthony. That was awesome. Thank uh, you. Hey, do you want to scroll up the chat? I think the first question was from Elaine Martin. I mean, you can read them out and uh, uh, and and answer them. I think uh, she'd started out with asking the source of your illustration showing the long, tiny little roots of the lawn grass versus the. the uh, yes, so that was, I think it was actually listed on that. Let me see. Here we go. So that was from the Conservation Research Institute. I think that's a Midwestern Institute. So I'll share it again real quick. Um, hold on. So you see right up in the corner, the Conservation, oops, Conservation Research Institute right up in the corner. And this is an old map from 1995. And like I said, a lot of new information has come out since this diagram. This diagram in particular has made the rounds 
for decades, you know, 1995. But um, like I said, the, the newest research is really showing that these plants aren't accessing the aquifers like we thought they were, and that all of the water that they're absorbing is happening right at the surface. And for the most part, these roots, it's still a mystery, but the leading hypothesis again is that they're accessing nutrients and minerals this deep and they're not actually accessing water. Um, I will say that any shrubs, prairie shrubs, such as New Jersey tea, um, the sumacs, for example, they, those roots do go extremely deep as well. And those roots, the shrubs are accessing the aquifers, but the perennials and the flowers for the most part, the roots are doing most of the water absorption at the surface. Uh, since you did not, uh, I thought I would do a little picture of my backyard, pocket prairie, so to speak, just because I thought it would give people an illustration of how I actually did it. And you can comment on it. As you said, she, I mean, you, you said that fairly quickly, but I think it's worth it's especially for newer people to definitely talk <laughs> through it, right? So you can see that boring old grass lawn in my back. What I did, and this may not be, I mean, this is one of the techniques. As, as Anthony said, you can cut the sod and then rototill, let it sit for like, I don't know, three to six weeks, let the weeds come back up, rototill again, and then put the seed in because then you'll get fewer weeds. That's one option. And, and you can see that, you know, within, within weeks, your prairie starts growing. And, and you can see my, um, I don't know, the fourth picture here, you can see that little pocket prairie from the top of my house. Um, it's, it's really uh, pretty. Uh, I mean, that's what it looks like from close up, right? Once it grows out, it is just really brilliant and it bursts with life. Um, Anthony, do you want to talk about sheet mulching and, and other techniques as well? Because I think it's sure, useful sure. for people to know that. Yes, um, so sheet mulching, actually, I forgot all about your little pocket prairie in the back. That is a perfect example of a pocket prairie. Um, so yes, yeah, so sheet mulching, what you would do with sheet mulching is, um, you may also be familiar if you garden for vegetables, it's also known as lasagna gardening. Um, so with sheet mulching, what you do is you get some heavy duty cardboard or whatever cardboard you can find, it doesn't have to be heavy duty. But the, the main thing is that you don't want any, you don't want to limit the amount of ink and you want to limit the amount of grease. So you don't want to use pizza boxes, but you want to just use clean cardboard. Um, take all the tape off of this tape and you lay it down and you overlap it so that there's, there's no grass showing through. And then you layer on, you know, two to three inches of topsoil, compost or mulch. And that in time within two weeks, it will smother the lawn underneath and then you can plant directly into it. Um, the only negative that has come up with that method is just the fact that it tends to enrich the soil a little too much. So some of these prairie plants, even though the soils of prairies are, you know, very fertile, um, for the most part, a lot of our prairie plants, especially on Long Island, um, pre they prefer very lean soils. So we have very sandy soil on, on Long Island. And what may happen if you do the sheet mulching technique is your soil may be a little too rich and you may get some excess growth on your plants. But for the most part, it's nothing to worry about. It's a very easy method. Um, you don't have to break your back. You can just, you know, take the time, sheet mulch. Like I said, two to three weeks later, you can come in, the cardboard will start to be getting broken down at that point, And you can just take your shovel and plant in your plants. Um, Raju, I hadn't realized that you had started your garden from seed. So that's actually a whole different, you know, ball game with the seed. And like Raju said, it helps to prep the space. Um, you can even do it further than what you did where rototill the soil, let the weed seeds grow roto till the soil, let the wheat seeds grow again, and then roto till the soil. Because what you want to do is you want to burn out all of the dormant seeds that are in the seed bank within your soil, so that when you plant your and you sow your seeds, the only seeds that are going to germinate, or for the most part, the only seeds that are going to germinate are going to be the plants that you chose. Um, so a lot of the invasive species in particular and the non-native species, and, but also our native species, their seeds can stay dormant in the soil for decades. Um, so purslane is a non-native plant brought over from Europe. Um, that one, it's an edible plant. The seeds can actually stay dormant for 30 years or more in the soil. So that's something, you know, every June, everyone, you know, everyone on Long Island seems to get purslane popping up in their gardens because once the temperature hits that point, the seeds are stimulated to germinate. So whether it's your patio or your garden, you're going to end up with purslane probably if the soil is open. So that's one way of preventing weed seeds from being an issue if you're starting from seed. 
Um, a sod cutter is another great way. It'll just, you know, cut the sod and then you flip it over and then the roots will bake. Um, the grass itself will, will rot out and, and die. I just did this in to a garden in Rockville Center last week. We did the whole front yard. We, it was, you know, it's a decently small yard. So I used the sod cutter. I just got it last week. I was very excited to use it. It's a manual sod cutter. I have to kick it and it cuts the sod perfectly. And I just take it and flip. And then the next day I came back and I planted all of the little plugs, um, the blueberries, the, what we did was um, blue eyed grass, some purple love grass and some wavy hair grass. And we planted that in, we did um, hyssop leaf thoroughwort throughout the borders. And it's gonna turn into a really fantastic planting. And again, we, we opted for a short grass prairie with the lower grasses for, for that because it was the front yard. And that's also an option for you too. You don't have to do tall grass. You could do a short grass prairie if you're doing the front yard. There's plenty of short grasses. Um, little blue stem, even though it's one of the big four, is the, one of the smaller prairie grasses. So that could be your tallest grass if you really need to. And um, then you can opt for things like drop seed, um, just different species of drop seed, which is what I named my company after because Northern drop seed or prairie drop seed is actually one of the most ornamental and well-behaved grasses you could choose to, to plant in a garden. Um, and then there's um, the side oats grandma, there's, there's a whole bunch of different low growing species, grasses and wildflowers that you could use instead. Um, solarization, I mentioned earlier is another option for you if you're trying to kill off your grass. Usually it's sheets of plastic that you lay out and you just let this, you weigh it down, bricks, rocks, and you just let the sun bake the soil. This will also not only kill the grass that's growing already that you're trying to get rid of, but it will also kill off most of the seeds that are in the soil too, because it'll, it should bring the temperature up enough that it'll bake the seeds as well. Was there another, uh, am I forgetting another oh, technique? Yeah. Okay, I'm like thinking, I'm like, is there another technique I have to remind myself about for how to get no, no, started? I, I, I think that's that's pretty good. I mean, I just want to make sure that people um, know that this is not, I mean, when I did this, I was not a native plant expert, right? So I just want you to know it's a fairly straightforward thing. Anybody can do it. Um, just start with a yard, start with a space that is the right size for you. Don't take like, you know, 2000 square feet and get started. Just start with, you know, a couple hundred square feet. Um, uh, Anthony, you want to go back to the chat sure, and sure. Um, uh, check uh, the next question, I think, was from uh, Kerry. Uh, which garden centers are best in stocking native plants? I mean, hey. <laughs> yes, so, so most garden centers don't carry native plants. Um, I've heard some very interesting, I've actually gotten some very interesting responses myself when asking for native plants, um, whether it's looking at you like you have two heads to just exclaiming that everything that they sell is the native plant. Um, so like I said, I myself am now offering retail native plant sales. Raju with Rewild is offering um, spring and fall plant sales. I'm operating as a pickup location for the spring and fall plant sales. Um, KMS Native Plants is out in Lake Grove. She also has some native plants for sale. She specializes in native plants as well. She's also a moderator on the Facebook group. Um, she's a good friend. And then we have Rewa, um, sorry, not Rewa, we already spoke about them. Um, Long Island Native Plant Initiative, we also have um, spring and fall plant sales, or at least we, we plan on having a spring and fall plant sales. Um, and so look for those sales as well. Um, local Audubon chapters are for the most part doing their own organization um, plant sales in the spring and fall as well. Um, definitely join the Facebook group if you're on Facebook. And we tend to stay up to date with all of the local plant sales. So whether it's, um, you know, any organization is free to post their plant sale to that group. And then if you want, you can actually go on my website, dropseednativelandscapesli.com, and we'll post that information later for you as well. And you can sign up for the newsletter. And every week I provide an updated listing of native plants for you to choose from. And you can pre-order, you can prepay online, and then you can just come pick them up every Saturday from me down at my location at Crossroad Farms in Malvern. Um, so that's right off exit 17 on the Sunday State Parkway, very convenient. And like I said, you can pre-order everything. I can do special orders for you. I offer a large variety of native plants, especially prairie plants and also edible plants. So if you're into blueberries and raspberries, you wanna grow American plums, anything like that, um, just you know, email me and I can set you up with the, with the listing and we can get an order going for you. Um, I'm going to go down to Bia now. So hello again, Bia. Um, um, so Bia is a Rewild client and um, she also just picked up some plants yesterday from me. She picked up some spring ephemerals. So 
Yes. So on July 4th, you want to cut back two thirds of your plant matter. Um, and for the most part, it doesn't have to be every plant. It has to be the late summer bloomers and fall bloomers or, or any of the tall plants, which tend to be the late summer or fall bloomers. So you cut them back by two thirds, you leave a third of the plant. And I know it can be hard where you're, you don't want to do it. Um, I've been in that situation where I've experimented one year, I, you know, I cut it by half and I didn't get good results. So I finally said, all right, I'm going to go lower down. And it's recommended, you know, by multiple sources to cut it back by two thirds. So especially, you know, um, the perennial sunflowers, the taller golden rods, um, the grasses, you don't want to touch. You don't want to touch your grasses. You just want to let them do their thing. But for the taller flowering perennials that flower in late summer and early fall, what you want to do is you want to cut those back by two thirds around July 4th and leave a third of the plant and that'll regrow. You know, it'll regrow very quickly. And what that does is instead of having a very tall plant that's gonna flop over, you'll have more of a structure where it'll be stockier and bushier and it'll help itself stand up a little better. That flopping is actually beneficial. Um, it doesn't look nice in a, in a garden setting, but that's actually called lodging when it happens with grasses. And lodging is actually very beneficial for small animals and songbirds, especially in the wintertime, where it actually creates a little microclimate. It creates a lodge, if you will, um, where they can actually go in and rest and get out of inclement weather. And it's a nice little warm place for them to stay, you know, nice and, and safe from the weather. But um, most people don't appreciate that. So I recommend cutting back by two thirds around July 4th. So B also asked about bird feeders. I don't recommend feeding birds because the, um, if you're feeding birds in the suburbs, my view is you're stealing habitat from birds in the countryside. So I'd much rather, so vote with your dollar. So I'd much rather have people save up all of the money that they'd spend annually on feeding birds and put it just towards native plants. That's, that's my feelings on it at this point. You know, think about how much money you're, you're spending on bird seed. Most of the time too, bird seed is filled with fillers. Um, you're attracting house sparrows or starlings, which are non-native birds and actually kill our native birds. So those are invasive species that will actively seek out and kill our native birds and evict them from their nest cavities. Um, Red-bellied woodpeckers, for example, struggle to get by in the suburbs because starlings kick them out of their nest every year. They have to make multiple nesting sites every year and most of the time they get kicked out of them. So you don't want to attract those birds. So save up all your money that you'd spend on feeding songbirds. Don't take away habitat from birds out in the countryside. Instead, invest in your own property and invest in native plants right at home and, and provide resources to your local birds in that matter. Um, I'll go to Ketty. Ketty B, do you have a lot of weeding or any weeding? So weeding, you know, it's a garden. So there's always going to be weeding. And like I mentioned, the invasive species and the non-native species are what you have to keep a lookout for. Um, many times, once you get started with native plants, nat other native plants will find their way into your garden because of wildlife or just because, you know, they were there the whole time. You didn't acknowledge that they were beneficial or that they were a native plant that you wanted to keep. Um, so I've had asters blow into my garden. I've had white snake root blow into my garden, which is a toxic plant. It's in the Joe Pieweed family, but because of that toxicity, the deer, the deer won't eat it. And also the rabbits won't eat it. So it'll stay beautiful in your garden, it has beautiful white flowers in the fall. Great for pollinators to get ready for winter hibernation. And then the songbirds eat the seeds in the winter. So the seeds are wind dispersed, but you will actually see songbirds, especially fox sparrows, song sparrows, um, juncos. They will come and actually, will, they will kick with their feet at the seed heads and eat the seeds off during a winter storm. So white snake root's another one. Um, so for the most part though, you want to weed out at least twice a year, go through and see if you find any invasive species that might be growing in your pocket prairie or native gardens and get a handle on them before they establish themselves so that they don't end up, you know, causing any more eco ecological damage. Okay. And one of the most common things I find, Anthony, is that squirrels will put nuts in there or, you know, the trees. Oh, that yeah, make yeah. Them. Yeah, well, and if you like, you know, if you like acorn, if you like your oak trees like me, you know, oaks are the top, I think oaks are the number one, actually, um, producer for um, caterpillars in our region. Um, so, 
that's fine. But again, you don't want an oak shading out your prairie garden. Um, that wouldn't be a good thing. But um, you can incorporate some other oaks. You could incorporate some dwarf chestnut, uh, dwarf chinkapin oaks. You can incorporate some bear oaks or maybe some uh, um, blackjack oak, which stays really short and doesn't cast shade really. It, it's more of a shrub. Um, so those might be options if, if you want to grow oaks. But yeah, for the most part, the squirrels do bring in a lot of stuff. I have, I have issues with the, the fruit eating birds. They'll bring in non-native mulberries. They'll bring in porcelain berry. Um, and, you know, poison ivy can sometimes I get bearberry, which I don't grow bearberry, barberry, I'm sorry, not bearberry, barberry. Um, I've had to take seedlings of barberry out of my garden before. Um, so, so that's, that's, you know, the fruit eating birds do themselves a disservice without knowing and they end up dispersing a lot of the invasive plant seeds because that's just the food that's available. We've completely altered the ecosystem. And if that's all that's available, that's all you're gonna eat, especially if it's the dead of winter and there's nothing else. So by increasing the amount of native food sources and native fruit, so the more native honeysuckle you plant out, the more native um, service berry, the more native choke berry, that you'll start finding more and more in your garden and the neighboring community as time goes on because the songbirds will start utilizing that more. Right, just just my, my as a naive, like a beginning rewilder perspective, right? The weeding is not much in the sense that compared to my um, vegetable garden, which requires a lot of weeding. Yeah. Per <laughs> area, the, because these are perennials, they crowd out, they fight for space. Yes. <laughs> but there's a lot of knowledge involved. So iNaturalist or whatever is your app, of choice can become your best friend. So it's learning the plants, I think, is the is where the challenge is for a beginner more than the amount of work that's involved in pulling the Yeah, plant. yeah. yeah. And, and to what you said too, um, that's the actual main goal is you want to plant densely. Any native planting you want to plant densely, but particularly a prairie planting, you want to plant densely densely. So with a prairie planting for so like if I was doing a pocket prairie for a client, I would be using landscape plugs. So these are two inch wide plugs. Um, the root systems tend to be about four inches long and they are landscape ready plants that you put in the ground. They establish that first year and they'll even bloom that first year. So if you put a butterfly weed plug in it, you'll get blooms that year, even though it's that tiny. And you, the goal is to plant them on 12 inch centers. And that gives you the optimal coverage. Um, you could go shorter, but it tends to get expensive at that point. And you can go a little wider to 18 inches or even 24. But again, then you run into, I have to weed the garden more because the plants themselves support each other. They form a matrix and they form a community and they outcompete other weeds from coming in and germinating. So they shade the soil. They act as the live mulch. That's another term. So your plants will be your live mulch where it doesn't have to be a plant here and a plant here. And then you have mulch in between. You want plants, 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 plants. You don't want spaces in between your plants. If you go out into a prairie system, there's no spaces between the plants. If you go out into the woodland, for the most part, there's no spaces between the plants. There might be leaf litter because it's a woodland, but for the most part, there, there's really no spaces in nature. Um, nature abhors a vacuum. So if you don't fill that empty space with a plant that you want, nature's going to throw whatever's available at it. So you'll end up with something you might not want. So, so that's um, the, the, the weeding part of it. The more densely you plant, the less weeds you'll have. And then you can get smart with it where your taller plants, um, you know, you plant them spaced out as you would, and then you can fill in in between with naturalizing plants. So wild strawberry is a good one. It's an aggressive um, ground cover where it will send out runners and fill in really nicely. Um, some of the lower grass, uh, lower grasses. So the, the drop seeds, a great option. Um, creeping flocks is a great option because it, it'll creep over and fill in the empty spots and, and act as that live mulch preventing weeds from coming in that you don't want and germinating and growing. So I'm going to go to Luis and then I'm gonna to go to Francesca cause she has a great question. So a brackish stream in your backyard, um, with that, you would like, you would want to opt more for maritime plants or maybe even salt marsh plants. So you, so there's salt tolerance, which means salt spray, and then there's salt soil tolerance, which is more what you need for the brackish area. Um, so salt meadow cord grass is a great one. Salt, um, salt, meadow, salt meadow prairie grass is another one. Um, 
hibiscus. We have a native hibiscus uh, salt, eh, not salt. It's a rose swamp rose mallow is is our native hibiscus, which grows in the in Abrakish the areas. There's also um, seaside mallow, which looks very similar to our hibiscus, which is another um, very rare plant. Um, I'll actually be offering that later in the fall. Um, that one is really, really attractive. And that grows all along our salt marshes and our brackish areas. So you have to go for brackish plants. Um, feel free to email me, Luis, and I can get you a list of what would work for you because that's a very particular planting um, situation for you. Because again, you don't need salt tolerance, you need salt soil tolerance. So there's a certain level of salt inundation in the soil, which you need to pay attention to. Um, so Francesca, you asked how important is it to source your native plants locally versus online? Um, someone before had mentioned Prairie Moon. So Prairie Moon is a great, um, oh, it's Barbara. Hey, Barbara. So Prairie Moon is a great resource. Um, Prairie Nursery is another great resource. Sometimes, even myself, I will go to these sources and I will buy plants that no one else has just because they're the only person offering it. The issue is those genetics are plants. Those are the ecotypes for those plants. The genetics are for Midwestern um, conditions. So little blue stem, for example, grows over the entire country. So from the East Coast to the West Coast, but you don't wanna be planting out blue stem with genetics from California in New York because, or, or genetics from Florida in New York because those genetics are not conditioned for our environment and our climate. So you, so that's where places like Limpy plays a, um, a role. Um, you know, you can even go out to, to nurseries in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and, and in New England, it would be better than going to the Midwestern states or down South. Um, so Limpy, that's one of the main reasons, probably the main reason is why we're trying to preserve that genetic heritage so that we, because there is no one really offering plants for our little spot in, in, in the world. You know, Long Island is smack dab in the middle between the New England states and the Mid-Atlantic states. And those are two, the, besides being a political border boundary, those are, that's also um, a ecological um, plant community boundary as well. So, so um, you know, Long Island, if you look on like the Southeastern grasslands map, like we're the Northern extent of the Southeastern grasslands for North America. And you would never think that. Um, but we're, you know, so if you're going to use plants, try to find plants from genetic sources within uh, 200 miles of where you live. Um, even Doug Tallamy said you don't, even if you're planting a plant that's not native specifically to Long Island, he even says you really don't want to go further than 200 miles outside the radius of where you live if you're selecting a plant that isn't native to your exact county. Uh, I think somebody asked if uh, what the sun requirement was, uh, but you could do a variety of different, um, uh, I mean, as long as it's not perfect shade, right, correct? Yeah, yeah, so pocket prairies need full sun. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the main limiting factor with the pocket prairie. Um, you can make it out of the smallest space you possibly have. You can obviously get more diversity with the larger the space, but the main um, constraint is going to be sun. Prairies need full sun. They have no tree canopy. There may be a couple of trees here and there, like a couple of cherry trees or maybe a couple of aspens here and there. But for the most part, there's no tree cover there in full sun. And that's what a pocket prairie needs. And most of the plants that grow in prairie ecosystems prefer full sun. Um, you know, little blue stem will pop up in open woodlands, which at that point too, you know, a savanna is an open woodland. So we actually have, so, you know, you could parts of the oak brush plains and the pine barrens on Long Island are reminiscent of a savanna ecosystem, which is something that actually exists down in the southeast of the United States, longleaf pine savanna, um, where you would have an open woodland of pinelands with grasslands in between. Africa, you have savanna as well, except that savanna has acacia trees and grassland and grass plants in between. So there's different, you know, it's the same type of ecosystem with different plants making up the community. So Eileen asked about the seeds. Um, someone mentioned Ernst, Ernst Conservation Seeds. Oh, it's Barbara. Um, Ernst Conservation Seeds is a great place. Um, Prairie Moon does have seeds. So that's another good option for you. Um, I could actually get seeds too from, from Pinelands in, in New Jersey, which is a great option because again, it's very close to where we are 
geographically speaking. So if you're looking for a large source for seeds, um, you need bulk seeds, you can always ask me and I can price you out for, for some of those seeds that are um, compatible with where we live coming from New Jersey. Um, so Barbara, yes, cut back ironweed. Ironweed is one of those plants um, that gets very decently tall and it blooms in late summer, early fall. So that's another one where you can cut it back. And again, you can experiment. Um, if you have a few plants, maybe cut back two, leave one. Um, another option, what you could do is if you have a grouping of plants, you can cut back only the front ones. And what that'll do is they will stay short and help support the back ones. So you'll have, and what that'll also do is the one in the back will bloom at the normal time. And then the ones in the front will bloom a week or two later. So you'll have you can actually extend your bloom period by getting creative with your pruning as well. And that'll uh, give you a little uh, cascading effect of the bloom times. And that, that's, a, that's a little beneficial also for not only you with ornamentation, but also providing um, resources for pollinators and other wildlife. Yeah, so um, Marsha, oh, there's a, oh, okay, Kathy, I'll go to Kathy first. Great article on oaks in the Sunday's New York Times. I'll have to look for that. Marsha, Barberry is not native. It is native to Asia. Um, it's highly invasive. And it also happens to form a perfect microclimate for ticks. Um, so if you're especially in tick country, whether you're on the North Shore of Ness County or South Shore, um, or even out East where there's a big tick problem because of the deer and the mice, um, it does create the perfect conditions for ticks with the humidity and they tend to actually nest and, and, and rest in barberries. There's been documented cases of showing that tick populations are higher where there's large understories of barberry. There's places where, you know, the entire understory of the woodlands will be barberry because it's that much of a problem and that invasive. So that's why if a barberry pops up in my garden, I remove it. It hasn't happened often, but um, it has happened before. Yeah, so creeping flocks roots wherever it goes, Kathy, and creeping flocks, you can make little cuttings and, and move them around. That's actually how all the named cultivars are creeping flocks. It's very rare to find the straight species, um, but for the most part, like uh, pink or the, you know, the, all the various colors, candy stripe, whatever, those are clone cultivars and that's how they're made. They're made by cuttings, wherever they root, you know, they cut it and they make a new pot, new potted plant out of it. And that's how it's sold. They're all clones at that point. So Jessica wants to plant gladiolus. I don't think gladiolus is an invasive species, so I think that's okay. Um, so there's a few non-native species that are not invasive, and those are okay. Um, so again, do your research though. And so um, lilacs are considered non-native, uh, non-native but non-invasive. Tea roses non-native, non-invasive. Hostas non-native, non-invasive. Um, but again, for me, if I'm doing a prairie pocket, a pocket prairie. Um, the gladiolus may, you know, throw off the whole look of that. So I wouldn't, wouldn't want that in, in my pocket prairie. It, 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 it would not possibly survive because some of my native plants, once they establish, they are just way um, able to survive. I mean, I, 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 again, I plug for a pocket prairie from somebody who just stumbled into it from just, I don't know, um, chance, right? Um, it's so much less work than a lawn. There is no mowing twice a week or once a week. There's no watering. I mean, I water in summer when it gets really hot. Of course I water them because I don't want them. I want flowers and I want them to look pretty. But, you know, it, it, the month, no chemicals, no pesticides, songbirds, dragonflies, everything, name it. It's there. It's just such a delight to walk out of your kitchen in the morning and say, hey, you know, it's a completely different garden. From week to week so I, it's just such a delight um <laughs> not saying that to sucker you into something that you'll regret for the rest of your life i'm telling you truly it is a delight if you're able to get it and and you are somebody that enjoys um nature in the backyard so, so thank you so much anthony i think um you know uh, uh as i i didn't know you were up to four thousand members and growing at 100 members of uh, a week that is an enormous public service in addition to everything else that you do for us um, thanks, everybody. Uh, you know, I'm so glad that you're planting uh, or considering planting natives. Reach out to uh, Anthony, if you don't mind, put your email in the chat so folks will know how to get in touch directly with Anthony. 
uh, and you all know how to reach me, uh, admin at rewildlongisland.org or raju at rewildlongisland.org. Uh, thanks so much. Have a wonderful night and uh, happy spring. Take care, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you. This is great. Thank you.